Welcome, everyone, and welcome to the Fish and Wildlife Commission Committee Day. Uh, we're really excited to gather again together. We've got a lot of important business uh, before us today and tomorrow. I uh, look forward to uh, a robust discussion and certainly a big a window for uh, business for us, but particularly with the budget, and we're looking forward to it. I do uh, want to recognize Ron Crabtree with Quill Forever. We appreciate you being with us. Again, it's always good to see you. I know we'll have important guests uh, both today and tomorrow, uh, but want to welcome everybody back. Um, it is a very important day in Tennessee history. Does anybody know what extra special day today is in Tennessee history? Forty years ago today, <laughs> Kurt Holbert was born. <laughs> Happy birthday. Forties. Do you have anything you want to say on your 40th birthday? To, okay. Nothing. Proclamations <laughs> for the future? No. All I can say is uh, it's very much different than 30. <laughs> A lot of difference. Yeah. yeah. Things hurt with no explanation. I know. Uh, and, and Connie, we appreciate you sharing this wonderful day. With him. With that, we'll um, uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order and uh, properly and call the roll. Jeff Gardner. Angie Box. Here. Bill Cox. Here. Connie King. Here. Chad Baker. Here. James Stroud. Here. Bill Swan. <coughs> Kent Woods. Here. Brian McLaren, Here. Tony Here. Sanders, Here. Kurt Holbert, Here. Jeff Cook, Here. Jamie Woodson. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. Excellent. Um, we'll move shortly into uh, the committee meetings, and I would just sort of uh, remind everybody of a, a few sort of uh, rules of the road as we go. Obviously, want to have a uh, full and thoughtful discussion on the agenda items before us today. Uh, for members of the public and members of the commission, just a quick reminder, would be wonderful if you could set your tone, uh, your phones to uh, silent mode. If you need to take a call or need to tend to your business, feel free to step out of the room, uh, but it would be great to have a, um, uh, other than discussion, a noise-free environment from electronics. Uh, want to also remind folks that we've got, for any public discussion on the issues, uh, we'll have three minutes. Want to make sure that uh, individuals who've come uh, to speak on any particular issue get a full and fair chance to be heard. Um, and as those discuss discussions continue, uh, whoever's chairing the committee will be who the member of the public will be visiting with, um, and questions will be directed to that chairman. And just in terms of discussion, I'll just remind uh, members of commission for as committees get started. Uh, direct your questions and recognition to the chairman of the committee so that we can make sure everybody gets a, a chance to be heard and, and get their questions answered because we've got some big business before us today. And with that, unless there are any other announcements from members of the commission? Yes, sir. Commissioner Stroud. Uh, I don't know if this is an appropriate or time or not, but I know we're all sort of watching this Houston thing. And um, I was told that we have some of our people down there and if it's okay with everybody, maybe tomorrow have someone just sort of give us a, a you know, a, a detail as to what, who's who's down there and who we have down there, and and uh, certainly all of us need to keep those people in our prayers. But I would love a, some kind of a, a report or uh, just some kind of information as to what we're doing, so I can tell and we can all express to our people, you know, that there is some activity from us. I think it's very appropriate to do that. And Director Carter, if it would work with you, we'll do that top, uh, top of the day tomorrow. Does that work? Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions or announcements? Excellent. Chairman Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Wildlife Committee would like to recognize John Mike, the Region 4 Wildlife Manager, to discuss Proclamation 1709, amending Proclamation 802 during the North Cumberland WMA. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present this proclamation. Uh, as I mentioned, this is Proclamation 1709, 
which is an amendment to Proclamation 0802. Uh, and this is dealing with the High Cliff property that we acquired. Uh, wrong button. <laughs> oh, uh, the high cliff, something always goes wrong with me on these computers, so y'all just please uh, be patient with me. Uh, the high cliff property is in the northeast corner of Campbell County. Uh, it's approximately uh, a little over 5,100 acres and uh, a very unique piece of property. And within this proclamation of 1709, as I mentioned, it's amending proclamation 0802. 0802 was the proclamation that identified North Cumberland Wildlife Management Area. And uh, 1709 is basically is those lands in the northeast portion of Campbell County owned by the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency east and west of Highway 25W, north and south of Highway 90, and at the High Cliff High Cliff unit comprises a total of 5,119.84 acres uh, and that we would like to proclaim this as a management unit of North Cumberland. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, John. Are there any questions from the Wildlife Committee? Is that going to give us eight units instead of seven? Oh, it's... I, there's no elk on this property, if that's what you're talking about, as far as a hunt unit. Yeah, there's no elk at all on this property. How far How far do we have to go to put from elk on this property? Well, part of it is looking at the habitat. Uh, most of this is, is closed canopy forest. Uh, we acquired this from lime timber. Uh, they cut what timber could be cut um, that was feasible to be cut. So what we're looking at is going in and seeing what we can do. Um, there are some areas that have been heavily harvested as far as timber. We may have to go in and, and put in some fire breaks, see if we can put some fire on the, on the ground there to improve the habitat. Uh, Joe Elkins, the area manager, needs to get in there and, and look at some of the areas that, that would be conducive to permanent wildlife openings. So there's a lot that we're going to have to do as far as improving the habitat itself. Now, as I mentioned, it's, it's unique. Uh, as you can see, this is, we have a, the Jellico uh, librarian is the, one of the county historians. Uh, he's been giving us a lot of information on this property. And this is where that, that picture came from. Uh, we do have a, a natural bridge on the property. And uh, Tim, do you want me to tell the story? OK. So this is close to the site where our, our chief of real estate had an accident. But anyhow, um, it's, it's, as Tim can tell you, it is very rugged. And, uh, what, to produce something that would be conducive to elk habitat, I, I don't really know how much we can. I mean, how far how far are we away from reclaimed land? On the, I mean, how far is our closest elk, do you think, to that property right now? By air miles, uh, probably at least five air miles. Okay. I mean, it's it's if the habitat is improved, they, they can show up, but... We, we, just, we just need to do some work on it. Is it going to be a bear habitat, you think? No, what we're shooting for is since a lot of it has been timbered, is to try to maintain a lot of that in uh, early successional habitat and then have our foresters go in and assess the timber that's there right now. And also, we have to be somewhat protective of different areas of it that uh, Bart Carter can address some of the issues on aquatics. Uh, but we have some, some unique aquatic species that occur in some of those creeks on the property. So we're going to have to protect some of those riparian areas. But uh, some of the other timber that we can get into, it's just going to have to be assessed whether we need to do thinnings, whether we need to do uh, some type of timber management improvements on it. It's, it's, we've only had the property finally approved as ours just for a short time period. So we just need to get in there and assess what we have and what we don't have and what we need to do. Commissioner Cox. John, does that include hunt, any other kind of hunting? Turkey, deer? And yes, sir. 
I mean, it's, it's going to be open to statewide seasons. It's going to be uh, open to the seasons that are for North Cumberland, uh, which almost all of those are, are same as statewide. The deer season at North Cumberland is a little bit different, but it coincides with the statewide season. Okay. Why did you pick North Cumberland? It's, I mean, it looks like it's 50 or 60 miles away. Well, no, sir. Uh, let me go Closer back. Than that. The, if I can get the cursor, well, it's not showing up on the slide. The green there, that's part of the, the Tackett Creek unit. Yep. You said North Cumberland. Yes, sir. This is, this, the Tackett Creek is part of, oh, it's, it, part, okay. it's right. the man, uh, Tackett Creek unit of North Cumberland. Oh, so, okay. uh, and that's why I say as far as where we know some elk exist, it's probably about five air miles. Uh, or we know we have some elk on Tackett or see them regular. I'm not talking about the elk. I'm just talking about other other things. What are what are the in holdings? What kind of problems does that present? Tim may answer some of those because I'm I'm not sure who the in who has the in holdings, the people that have it, or if it's a company. Uh, Any, any other comments or questions from the Wildlife Committee? Do you have one, Chad? Yeah. What do you, what do you, th what do you have in your budget? You think to manage this extra five thousand acres a year? What do you, what do you anticipate that's going to cost us? We, we have it because we don't really know what we're going to have to do. Uh, Stephen Doby with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has already talked to us uh, about. Some, some money they may have available to assist with habitat work up there. Now, as far as the amount, I'm not sure. He just said they had some money they might be able to help us with. Any other comments from the Wildlife Committee? Any comments or questions from the public? Okay, this will be a vote from the Wildlife Committee today. So uh, all okay. in favor? I'll make a motion for passage of Proclamation 1709. All right. Thank you for jumping ahead a little bit. Thank you very much. So I have a motion and a second. So this is, again, a vote for the Wildlife Committee. So uh, all members in favor of passing Proclamation 1709, amending Proclamation 0802 on the North Cumberland WMA, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Mark Goodland. Uh, Chief of Wildlife and Forestry Division to discuss Proclamation 1713, amending Proclamation 1705, WMA's refuge season limits and miscellaneous regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to present the Proclamation 17-13, amending Proclamation 1705, which covers our wildlife management areas, public hunting areas, and refuges. And uh, what this addresses is a... Um, an error that we caught in the proclamation regarding the bear seasons on North Cherokee. And as you see here on the slide, uh, currently reads bear, same as statewide season, except closed September 23rd through October 6th. And it would change to uh, closed September 23rd to October 1st. Uh, we did not intend to change, shorten the hunting season there by uh, five days. And, and so with this change, uh, we would make it, uh, closed October 1st, um, the closure would end and then would open open the next day, so to correct it. And we wouldn't have this. We've been in contact with uh, uh, um, the Bear Clubs about this already and of course would, would publicize this. On one hand also, uh, the way it reads currently, you would have nobody hunting during that time, so, and we'd actually be opening it up more to hunting, so not the issue of where it looked, you looked in the hunt guide and it was open and you had to close it. So from that aspect, it's uh, the better of the two situations. Thank you, Mark. Any questions or comments from the Wildlife Committee? I had a complaint from a constituent saying that uh, the training season was overlapping 
with the archery season. And I had been kind of busy. I hadn't had time to look that up. Um, that they could be running, uh, they could be running their dogs when we had a, when we had a, a, a steel hunting season uh, available. Is that is that the way we have it right now? If it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, I anticipated there might be some questions on this, and I'd like to call our bear program leader, Dan Gibbs, uh, to the podium as he has a lot more intimate knowledge of the situation. I understand. Thank you. Uh, one thing, I appreciate that question because it's a good opportunity to explain it. And as we talked about the other night, uh, a lot of it comes down to the calendar. You know, we just run out of days. But if you take a quick look on private lands, the training season ends September 24th, and the archery season opens September 23rd. So you're talking about two days of overlap there. And then on the Cherokee, which they have a different training season because the Forest Services request that we stay away from early, late summer and, and the Labor Day holiday and whatnot, their training season ends September 30th and their hunt opens their first day is October 2nd, so there's no overlap there. So we're only talking about a couple of days. So basically, if they're hunting on private land, they could talk to the landowner and the landowner could, he could limit people training on him for other people that wanted to be bow hunting, correct? Absolutely, he could yeah. just say, we, you know, you guys can train up till archery season opens and then you can or stop. You so could, yeah, the that, it would be up to the landowner. If a landowner wanted to stop them two weeks before to keep everything calm before the guy goes in there to bow hunt, uh, it'd be a good it'd be a good situation for the guy that's archery hunting, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Any other comments, Sir Commissioner Cox? There's always been this overlap on tall Cherokee. For training? Yeah, training running into bow season. I mean, they hadn't got but a week. There isn't any on the North Cherokee. It's on private property is where that, that overlap runs. And once again, it's just a calendar issue. Uh, depends on how many, where the days fall. Some years it might be two days. Other years it could be three. Some days, years maybe one. So. Anyone else on the committee? I'll make a motion. Adopt. Anyone from the public have a comment or question? So we have a motion to adopt. How about a second? Okay. A motion a second and this is again a vote for the wildlife committee so all in favor of proclamation 1713 amending proclamation 1705 for uh, wma's psa's refuges hunting seasons limits and miscellaneous regulations please say aye aye any any opposed none that, that passes well thank you mr chairman i got one more unassociated question kind of we i saw dan we had a, a mistake in the hunting guide that about rifle hunting bear and it wasn't allowed and we're trying to get the word out about that how is that how are you going to handle that sorry i stepped down i didn't realize you were going to ask that uh, what commissioner cox is referring to is the hunting guide lists the um, the uh, first five days of the uh, statewide gun deer season is also concurrent with bear and uh, there's had been no dogs allowed on that hunt and in the guide they dropped the word no and so it says dogs allowed uh, we've had at least one or two news releases go out. Uh, we've talked to multiple uh, bear hunting groups. I talked to a gentleman yesterday about this uh, very thing. And so, as I've been telling people, this is opening weekend of gun season, and very few of your bear hunters are going to want to have their dogs out on the ground on opening weekend of gun season for deer. So uh, we're really not anticipating any issues with this they the bear hunters know what the agency's intent was and uh, I believe if Darren is here I believe the plan is if someone is hunting during that four days they're going to be issued a warning on the first offense and then a citation for anything else that may happen so that's been been uh, put out as well yeah that's correct we have sent out a law enforcement direction memo to address the situation so we should have a pretty good handle on it Thank you, Madam Chairman. That completes the Wildlife Committee business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, we'll move into the Fisheries Management Committee. Chairman King. Yes, uh, I'd like to recognize Chief Frank 
Theus to give us a preview of the sport fishing and the commercial fishing. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let's see if I can get this away. What are you seeing? That's great. Okay. So this is the this is the time of year when we bring the proposed changes to the, the commission. There's a process that gets us here. If I can get this clicker to work, but I'm not. I'll, I'll use the arrow button. Okay. So here we are in uh, in August, but the, this process starts much earlier in the year. We we solicit public comments in the month of April. Then our biologists meet in May to discuss their comments and, and issues that they're observing on the lakes uh, and, and streams as well. Uh, the, the public comment process is just one way we get information from the public. We regularly meet with people at, uh, at, you know, at fishing events where people call in. So I don't want to give anyone the impression that that public comment period is the only in, in, uh, input that we get from the public. But any, so anyway, we get that information. The May biologist meeting, we discuss our proposals and we decide which ones we want to bring forward to the commission. And then in June and July, we, we, we move them around about the agency through law enforcement and other divisions to see what, what we ultimately want to present. And that brings us to this meeting in late August this year. The, the, the very first uh, presentation I want to give you is about the Upper Cherokee Reservoir. And this is a place where we have a a pretty well-known paddle, sport paddlefish fishery for snagging. It's been open from April 1st to the 15th for years. People come from you know, hundreds of miles to fish this. And the, the recommendation is that we close the area before and after the season. You know, we, have, we have some people that are fishing, snag fishing for just anything on the 16th and 17th, and we're observing some paddlefish carcasses. We don't want to see that, so we want to make it where uh, we would recommend the, the proposal to close the area, this upper reach of the Holston River and Cherokee Reservoir to snagging from March 1st to the 31st and then pick it up again in April 16th to the 31st. So this would eliminate this extra snagging that's going on. Another area, Another change we're recommending deals a little bit with snagging. The, the headwaters of Watauga Lake and some other reservoirs in the state have seasonal hook restrictions to protect walleye from snagging. So it, it requires anglers to have only one single hook while they're fishing in these areas. So there's no chance that you might be carrying a treble hook and snagging walleye, which can be really stacked in these areas in the, in the springtime. But we've got uh, we have one section of the Elk River arm on the Watauga on Watauga Lake that's really a river, uh, more a reservoir part of the river. It, you couldn't, you probably couldn't snag walleye in there. It's more, it, we, we feel like the regulation that we've had for the for years has really been overreaching. So we're we're reducing the area where we have the hook restrictions by about a mile and a third. So if you look at this is Upper Watauga Lake. There's the Elk River arm coming in. The current boundary is at point 11. The new boundary would be at the mouth of Row Branch. So that you can see just by the map that that's, that looks like a reservoir to most fishermen. So you can now fish with multiple hooks. This will allow people to fish crankbaits or whatever year round in that section. Okay, our next proposals deal with our trout fishing. We currently have four delayed harvest areas in the state. They're all in East Tennessee. And th these proposals would add two more to that. What a delayed harvest area is is a place where in the wintertime we can stock trout and people fish over them, catch and release with artificial baits only. And we can stock fairly light uh, stocking rates and provide a fishery during this time. And it's, it's an additive fishery and it doesn't take anything away from the normal harvest seasons later in the year. So there's two, two we're proposing. One is the Doe River within Roan Mountain State Park. This is a popular destination for a lot of reasons. We've worked with the state park, and they're eager to participate in this program. And Buffalo Creek is on our own WMA. So we have two areas with good public access for catch and release fishing over the winter. And the dates 
for each of them would be from November 1st through, well, for Doe River would be November 1st through the last day of February. We worked on this with the park to make sure it was what they would like as well. And, and the last, uh, usually the, the week following these delayed harvests is, is when we would normally be stocking anyway. So the, the people that are used to going there and harvesting fish following the, the stocking truck, literally in some cases, will still be able to do what they normally do. This is, this is an additive program for other anglers with relatively few fish. And on Buffalo Creek, we're looking at October 1st through January 1st because we usually start stocking Buffalo Creek for the, the harvest season in February. So, so these are all the proposals that we have. Uh, again, we'll, we'll probably get some public comment in the month to come and we'll bring this information back to you in Gatlinburg at the Fisheries Committee meeting there. Are there any questions? Members of the Fisheries Committee have a question, comment? Uh, that, uh, on the Holston, that's just close to snagging, not close to fishing, correct? Okay. And, it, and there's no hook restrictions either. It's just like any other place where we limit snagging. You just can't do it. And if you're using that manner and means and observe doing it, that's bad. I've hooked two of those big paddlefish up there myself on crankbaits, just bass fishing, you know, so. Yeah, there have been days where it's hard to fish for the paddlefish in there. Right, <laughs> I agree. right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Are those catch and release areas barbless hooks? They're not. They're, they're regular, even treble hook if you want. Barbless hooks, we're we we have we don't have near the fishing pressure in any of our fisheries to warrant that you're getting into heavy heavy reuse of fish before we get to that point i'm not a big big fan of that actually for a lot of reasons especially on if you're already artificial and you're i, I don't think we need that level of protection i'll leave it there but. okay well the next presentation i have is on the commercial fisheries Let's see if this one wants to. The screen seemed backwards. That's why I keep looking bewildered up here. The, um, so each year we meet with the Commercial Fishing, Fishing Advisory Committee as, a, as an agency with that body. And that's, that body is comprised of commercial fishers and wholesale dealers that talk to us about regulations like we were able to talk about that rule setting a rule making that, that occurred this year and explain that to them and we talked about other issues but at that meeting there were no recommendations that we left with as a result of that meeting we're keeping everything we, we'd like to have left everything the way it was this year but uh, a month or two later in staff meeting it was brought to our attention that there's interest in removing Asian carp from uh, floodwaters associated with the Mississippi River. Some of these are private water bodies. Well, most of these are that, that aren't currently open. So what we're recommending is that we would allow Asian carp harvest from Open Lake and Chisholm Lake in Lauderdale County. These are privately owned areas that get connectivity to the Mississippi River during floods. They would have, the commercial fishers would have to have permission of the landowner or an association of landowners, and if it was an H uh, association. And we would, would recommend that we restrict the, gill, the, the gear to gill nets and have them t attended at all times so they wouldn't be left overnight. And th this, this was sure that any non-target fish that are caught would have a good chance of survival when they're released. Madam Chair, that's a good question. Um, this Sure. I'll ask the first okay. not so smart question of the day. <laughs> oh. Is there, is, would there be an unintended negative consequence if we considered a policy that opened up? I mean, Asian carp is quite invasive. We've got, you know, a, an eye for eradication. Is there a reason why we wouldn't open up as many opportunities as we could instead of limiting it to just one or two places if there's a private agreement? and Asian carp are there and there's an interest in commercial fishing. I'm asking the question for understanding and information. Right. I'm not considering a proposal. I'm just trying to understand why we wouldn't have a, My understanding, open of a policy as possible. 
my understanding is that these are the lakes that were that people associated with these lakes have asked and we don't really want to list other people's lakes if, if they weren't interested in this uh, and I'd also like to take it as a first step see how it goes you know rather than go wide open go anywhere you want just get a landowner <laughs> approval we'd like to go as specific as possible as we step out here thank you and there is another spot here as you'll see in the next of course we own uh, at the agency owns some land oh, it's connected to at the times of the Mississippi River on uh, Willow Chute and Rhodes Lake in Moss Island WMA we would open that as well so there's a list of waters that are open to commercial fisher fishers to, to, to fish during the year and by not we need to add these these ones on there so that they can fish but again we would want to restrict them to gill nets and have them attended at all times and with that I'll take any questions that's uh, it's just one one small step towards maybe getting some more carp out of the system we've got other activities on in carp management ongoing but these are just is just one that would involve regulation changes I, Frank I'm following up with the chairman's question taking uh, taking a small step and just don't want to go wide open I don't I don't understand why not why would you just allow anybody that has this problem with permission of the owners to catch Asian carp under the same restrictions? If they ask you, you're going to do the same, you're going to let them do it. So why wouldn't you just make it available? Having, taking small steps to fight Asian carp doesn't, doesn't, yeah. doesn't make logical sense to me. I'm not really sure how much more. I know this is a recommendation. More, but no, I know. I know. It's a good time to talk about it. I'm not really sure how many more acres of how many more opportunities there are out there these are the big ones that we hear about um i'm open to that I, eric you got any could i could i ask eric if there was any uh any more thought to that yes. there are a few other water bodies that are that are um, counties associated with mississippi river um one of those being in shelby county uh, the landowner just hasn't come to us and ask us for any type of arrangement um, and most of the other water bodies that do flood tend to dry out so those are would not be necessarily available to commercial fishing at most most of the time during the year so Do you have a question? Uh, I have a question that might add to Johnny's this might be the really dumbest question <laughs> <laughs> we've been recently Fishing. Now, is it? And of course, we have license. But if you're taking somebody, do they have to have a license to boat fish just for carp, just like they do a game fish? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's fun. It's a fun sport. <laughs> okay. Any any other questions? Coming. Well. Okay. I guess I have a question. Uh, do <laughs> would you would you like us to consider uh, the? open all all private areas we would like to get that in a press release to get public comment on it if we were to do that that's all personally I don't see any downside to it somebody may see yeah, a no. downside to it what are the I think it's a good idea anybody have a downside you see It's not the we we, 
we will we'll discuss that even more and maybe bring that back next month as a as an option as well. One thought would be to require a registration of the contract with the agency to make sure that you all have an understanding of any commercial activities that would be taking place if you were to consider opening it up because I well they're already required okay. to report what they're doing now gotcha. so we probably I'm just thinking it may not be best for the agency to get involved in a contract between a private landowner okay. and well a you're already person. getting that information then. you are getting that okay information. so you yes. that you yes. already have that information it wouldn't yes, be something that would be going on otherwise great I'm sorry, Madam Chairman, as well as Frank, I should ask this question before, but on the paddlefish issue, did I hear you say that this, the season basically changed because people were, were, were fishing out of season? No, the, the season does not change. It's just that on, on the beginning and ends, of the, the weeks leading up to and the weeks after the season, you have no business snagging there. It's just so it would be like... I don't, I don't even know the hunting rules, but like, you know, you can't have a, a, a gun on you before, before hunting season and the day before that kind of thing, I guess. But the idea is if you, you shouldn't be snagging before the season now, uh, it's just that simple. So it does not change but what people are able, have been doing all along. It just makes it harder for anyone to, it makes it illegal for someone to show up and say they're snagging for red horse or something else. And and then be snagging paddlefish and harvesting them because that's what was, we were the agency was observing. So it just makes it a little. It makes it easier for law enforcement to to make a case on this sort of thing. Because you're isolating the seasons, and there's not the other exactly. fish that you're snagging for at the same time. It's all it's right. only paddlefish. Right. That, at that there, time. there'd be no fish you could be snagging yeah. during those windows that would be closed. Oh, so thanks. Keep it cleaner. Thank you.